reasons that I entitled this series The Deception of Grace is because the nature of grace is in a way deceptive because you have this ability, you have this enablement, you have uh, these things that are happening in your life and somehow you, you, you are able to do what you are not able to do not because you are able to do it. You see? So, on one hand, you are unable to do it. And yet, on the other hand, you are doing it. On one hand, you don't have the resources to do it. And yet, on the other hand, all the resource is available. On one hand, you are not able to reach where you're supposed to reach. And yet, we see you reaching where you are reaching. I always tell people, if God was to consult backgrounds, there is no way I would be standing before you declaring the word of God to you because my background is so messed up. You understand what I'm talking about? But the nature of grace is that way. The person who is unqualified all of a sudden becomes qualified and it is not because they have done anything. Simply, It is simply because God has done it. And so, and, and why has he done it? It doesn't make sense why he has done it because he would have all the reasons not to do it. And yet, he nonetheless goes ahead and does it for us. And gives it to us. And avails it to us. It is the nature of grace. It is the deception of grace. Because on one hand, I see you flourish. But when I look deep into your life, you shouldn't be flourishing. You shouldn't be where you are. You shouldn't be doing the things you are doing and yet you are doing them. And it is the deception of grace because when I, when I put you in my own measurements, you shouldn't be. And it is the nature of grace. It is the deception of grace because if we were to follow the proper lines... If we were to move by the proper protocols, if we were to do things the way they are supposed to be done, leave that thing alone. I don't, don't let it take your attention. If we were to walk the way we are supposed to walk, if you were to be able to do what you would need to do, then you would be damned. But the deception of grace is that all of a sudden, you are able to do what you are not able to do. I'll give you an example. So today we are talking about, uh, last week we talked about, uh, about uh, saving grace. We're here and we said saving grace is that grace that uh, uh, God saves you not because you've done anything. God gives you righteousness not because you've done anything, simply because he gives it to you. And we are saved by grace. By grace, you've been saved through your faith. And not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God. Today, we are going to talk about sustaining grace. Somebody says sustaining grace. And I told you that I'm talking about these things and uh, we, are, we are basically doing definitions. We are defining because the confusion that is in Kampala today about grace and how some people begin to teach and you don't know what exactly they are talking about is because there is a tendency to mix these things up and someone is on, on he starts out talking about uh, talking in saving grace and yet he's now uh, defining um, uh, sustaining grace and before you know it he's entering into an endowment grace and yet it's a whole mix and and you don't know what is what, what, so what is grace therefore and because I told you that because grace has at least four faces and we are looking at each of those faces today we are looking at the sustaining grace sustaining grace and sustaining grace is the grace that keeps you in the game so I'll give you an example uh, for me I grew up in church from the age of eight 
right? From the age of, because I first stayed with my grandmother, and my grandmother was a staunch Catholic, and so I was such a, a devoted Catholic with my rosary. I knew how to read all those what? Yes. To say the Bikra Marias and all that. And then, at the age of eight, I, I joined my mom and we began living together and she was already born again. So, I came along on with the ride. I was in church. However, even though I was in church, church was not in me. And there's a big difference. Because staying in a garage does not necessarily make you a what? A car. And so I was that kind of uh, young man who grew up in church, but church was not in me. And I heard these things in my private life that most people did not know about that were going on. But the one thing that was so pronounced was even uh, going up, uh, known, uh, because I had started working while I was young, I had joined a company and a group of, uh, uh, of young men on the village that was notorious. And one of the things that we enjoyed doing as a pastime was going to, to watch these Vivanda movies, yeah? You know, is Jingo still the one in motivated? Is he still there, Jingo? Like, he must be an old man because I was young, eh? but we would go to this river. Now, my mother really, really didn't want me to go to those places. In fact, in fact, she got me one day going because she would send you to the market and it would take you three hours to come. But the problem is, it's not actually the problem. The thing is, when you went to the market, you took off another two hours to watch John Rambo and Chuck Norris. All right? In a, in, a, in, a, in a Chivanda that was... Everyone was smoking. The, the things that were going on there. And I, some of you have gone to those places. Don't look at me funny. You've been there too. Uh, <laughs> you, you know how it was. Praise the Lord. My mother found out I was going there. And she did all she could to stop me from going there. She put up spies around to see me when I'm going there. But I somehow would find a way and I would go. She even got the LC person and took me there and the man beat me. The man came to me and said, if I ever find you again, I said, I will never. The following day, I was there. She caught me and took me to Pastor Peter. And Pastor gave me all the words. Yeah? Like all the scriptures. Why? I should obey my, pa my parents and not do these things. Also whipped me a few of those and I said I will never. The following day I was in Achivanda. You understand what I'm talking about? Now but at the age of 14, this man spoke a word that all of a sudden I began to see my brokenness and I went to the Lord and I said, Jesus, I want to give you my life. He preached on Sunday. I got saved on Monday. Because I had to get saved in the proper way. For some reason, even that after I got saved, even the sound of uh, that, those films became lawful to me. Up to now, I cannot watch... Uh, a movie that has been, I hear translated, eh? defiled. Uh, uh, up to now. Like, the place I used to enjoy, all of a sudden I went there and it's, I could smell 
all the sweat I could smell, all the alcohol I could smell, all the cigarettes I could smell, the darkness I could be, I began to see the cockroaches in the place. Like I, I hated the place. Up to now, from the age of 14, up to now, the Lord is my witness. I have never stepped in a Chivanda again. And I ask, I ask myself, what is it that happened? Because in the first place, I was caned. In the first place, they, they did all they could do to deter me from these places. And nothing stuck with me. But now that I've given my life to Christ, something has happened to my life that all of a sudden, the things that they used to say don't, and I did, now I am the one saying to myself, I am not. And I can give you examples and examples and examples and examples of how is it that you are a Christian and you've been a Christian for this long. You remember when you got saved and they told you, well, <coughs> you, you get saved, you. We give you this week, by the end of this week, you will be back. And the week came and passed and you're still standing. And they told you, ah, uh, ah, uh, this year, by the, ah, uh, waste, it was a waste, it was a, by the end of this year, you will be out of this thing. And what happened? The year came and now it is three years, they are saying, let's wait for the fifth, for the fifth year. But guess what is happening? There is something that God does when you give your life to him. The saving grace does not only come with just saving grace. Saving grace ushers in what we call sustaining grace. And the sustaining grace is what keeps you going. And, you are wonder, and they are wondering how come she's able to do it. And your answer should be now. It is by grace. I am not able to do what I am able to do because I am able to do it. Because in the first place, I had, I had an addiction. We have seen people who have come to Jesus Christ and they were addicted smokers. They were addicted to smoking and all of a sudden, they have let go. We have seen people who are sexual addicts come to Jesus and they were addicted. And all of a sudden, the thing is dropped. What happened? Sustaining grace is holding you. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen to the word of God. So we are going to read two scriptures. And uh, the first scripture we are going to read builds on the last scripture we read last Sunday. The first scripture is in Ephesians chapter two again but this time we'll do verses 10 now last week we did verses 8 and 9 verses 8 and 9 says for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself it is the gift of God not of works lest anyone should boast now here is the reason then he goes ahead to give you the reason why saving grace first of all came in he says, for you are God's workmanship. Somebody say, you are God's workmanship. For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. You are God's workmanship. You are God's workmanship. Now, the, the we in that scripture, when he says, for we, that we is very exclusive. It is not everybody. That we is referring to the person who has experienced verses 8 and 9. You understand what I'm talking about? That we refers is referring to the person who has been saved by grace through faith if you have been saved then the bible says you are god's workmanship in other words it is god do 
doing his work. It is God making you. It is God doing the thing that only God can do. You are God in his workmanship. Now, that word workmanship is the same word that is used in being created. In other words, the action that God did in saving you. Brothers, please listen carefully. The action that God did in saving you was a recreation of your being. God did not come and get the old you and turn the old you around. No. What God did is he recreated you. Ha! And so that recreation is recreated and you are recreated in Christ Jesus. And why are you recreated in Christ Jesus? For good works. Somebody say for good works. Okay, put it very simply. To do good things. God recreated you in Jesus Christ for the purpose of doing good things. In other words, you are not among the caliber of people that do bad things. <laughs> you are the kind that does good things. Sustaining grace. God, that's why the entire New Testament is filled with the language of new creation, new being, new, 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 born again, new, new, new. Why? Because God has recreated you. God has remade you. You are God's handiwork. Ah. It is God that sustains you. It is God that is making you. And he says, I remade you so that you can do good. Ah, I am created for good works. I am not addicted. If I am addicted, I am addicted to goodness. Yeah. Hallelujah, somebody. If, 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 if there is any being in me that is not good, that is not who I am. God has recreated me to do good works. That is what we call sustaining grace. Listen, you are not about to backslide. You are not about to fall. Your caliber is the caliber that does good works. Why? Because when God made you, he recreated you for good works which God prepared beforehand in other words before you were born again before you kept Jesus God looked at you and said Aha! this one can do some good in the world this one is a good boy he's a good man this one it has a spirit of I am putting a spirit of excellence in him. This one is not the kind that does terrible things. He's not a murderer. He's not a liar. He's not a thief. He's not a, a that's why he says when he talks about those good things he calls them the fruit the fruit of the spirit. In other words those things goodness, mercy love, eh? patience eh? those things just flow out of me. They just come out of me because he put them in me. He did. He created me for good works. Hallelujah. So the seed is in me. And it is that seed that comes out. That grows out and becomes and bears fruit. And bears fruit. And so I become patient. I become a truth teller. I become a, 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 a I become a person of self-control. I become a person of, of, of patience. I become 
is with me and it is with you come on I'm preaching good give a hand clap to Jesus now that is Paul Paul who writes these words is an apostle in fact is one of the greatest apostles and Paul had been a murderer and not just a murderer but a murderer of God's people Paul was the kind that if he found us in church today all of us he would round us up and not just throw us in Luzira prison but he would round us up and in the compound here tie a rope around each one's neck and break your neck that was Paul when God came to Paul when Jesus visited Paul you know what he did with Paul he turned him into the greatest preacher of the same gospel that he was fighting somebody said that is grace and we do not see in any one time at any one time we do not see Paul backsliding and going back no why because he is now God's workmanship created in Christ for good works which God had prepared for him before the works now I also wanted to show you the same concept spoken to us by Apostle Peter because Apostle Peter is also an amazing man Jesus had called him to become one of his disciples major apostles in fact not just an apostle but he is defined as a Peter he was the one that Jesus said you know I, I am going to leave my church in your hands But then Peter, Peter, with all his passion, with all his love for Jesus Christ, ends up denying Jesus Christ. But here is the deal. Before Peter denies Jesus Christ, Jesus looks at him. And tells him, Peter, before the cock crows three times, before it crows, you will have denied me three times. However, Peter, I have prayed for you. Because Satan has wanted to take you away from my hands. But Peter... I want you to know that I have prayed for you. <laughs> because listen, brothers and sisters, you are born again. There is no mistake that you're going to do in your life that is going to catch God by surprise. And I say those words exactly as I said them. I can repeat them. There is no mistake. You are going to do. Not that you have done. There is no mistake. You are going to do. In your life. That is going to catch God. By surprise. Every mistake you are about to do. God has already seen it. Before you did it. He has already seen it before you did it. And as Jesus told Peter, Hey, hey, hey I have seen you denying me three times in one night. But I have prayed for you. And so the scriptures tell us that Jesus Christ is right now seated at the right hand of God praying for you and me listen you are not going to fall away you are not going to backslide because sustaining grace is still holding you even if you go and go a thousand days a 
away from him that sustaining grace will pull you back by force and bring you back into your place so Peter writes to the church and in his second letter this is how he introduces his second letter first Peter second Peter chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 he writes and says grace and peace somebody said grace grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord now first of all notice grace has a twin and first of all this grace that Peter is talking about here is not the saving grace why because the saving grace cannot be multiplied once you are saved uh, you are saved right you are saved so you do not need saving grace anymore but you need the sustaining grace to keep you in the game and the letter that peter is writing he is writing it to people who are already believers he is writing it to, ch to the church of jesus christ men that are already born again and he says grace and peace be multiplied to you in other words this grace that he is talking about has in itself the ability to grow and grow and increase and increase are we together that's why the new believer will always have some things that are still to be worked on all of us are on a journey and depending on where you are on that journey there are certain things that will not conquer you and there are other things that might conquer you are we together and yet even in the things that are right now conquering you 10 years from now they will not be the things that will now conquer you because this grace is multiplied and it says it is multiplied in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ in other words the more you come to know God now that word knowledge that word knowledge there you know in the Greek they have two words for knowledge one word is the word no is the word gnosis somebody said gnosis as you, you see that's where the English get no yeah? to know the word is gnosis and then there's another word called epignosis say epignosis so they add on an epi on the gnosis to get the what the epignosis you get a greek now epignosis i rarely do this but i wanted to make that differentiation because what peter writes here is i rarely use the word called epignosis and that word uh, denotes or tells you of a knowledge that you continue to grow in you come into a knowledge you are continuing to come into that's why he uses the word multiply let it be multiplied because you continue the more you know the more the grace abounds the more you know the more the grace abounds the more you know the more the grace abounds in the knowledge and acknowledgement so in other words the more you get to know God or the more you get to acknowledge God the more sustaining grace expands some of us are still struggling with things we should not be struggling with because our knowledge of who we are in Jesus Christ has been lacking and 
so your sin problem your, your, uh, pastor I'm still struggling with this you know I'm struggling with this the reason you, your struggle has nothing to do with your ability your struggle is a knowledge problem that day you convince yourself of what God has done is the day you begin to conquer you begin to conquer you begin to conquer because he says grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge epignosis in the acknowledgement in the continuous knowing of God and Jesus Christ and he says as his divine power has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness in other words you see how he says we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works he says his divine power God has given to us all things that we need to live life well and not just to live life well but to live it in the godly way in God's nature in the way God would live it ah that is called sustaining grace grace is multiplied the more we get to know what God has deposited in us the better we are at living this life listen you're not a liar you are a truth teller his divine power has given to you everything you need to tell the truth you are not a rumor monger you are a confidant why his divine power and let me tell you there's things that god has done for us that are undeniable that's what we call sustaining grace listen how does a drunkard a guy who has been such a drunkard let go of his alcohol it is the grace of God and that grace has a name to it it is called sustaining grace how does a prostitute get out of prostitution it is not by power it's not by mind it is by the Spirit of God and that is called sustaining grace how does a corrupt official stop being corrupt it is not by telling them and giving them one seminar after another there is a grace that helps you to keep going when others are not doing what you're supposed to do hallelujah how does an aggressive abusive person then become a protector of other people it is the sustaining grace that holds us hallelujah 